so I'm Karan Singh, uh, I'm a professor at the University of Toronto, and my area of work for the, probably for the past 20, 25 years has sort of been in what I would call sort of art-driven uh, interactive graphics. So I actually believe that there is a, a, both an artist and a scientist in, in all of us. And uh, it doesn't really matter in the end whether it's the art that drives the science or whether it's the science that drives the art. It's all good, you know, uh, as long as they play happily together. So that, that sort of characterizes my work in a nutshell. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about perception, a little bit about drawing, uh, and about essentially using these two together as uh, a means to create interactive modeling tools. And it's always great to uh, follow up on a bunch of other talks that have gone because uh, a lot of what they've talked about is complementary. A lot of what they've talked about uh, sets up the context for what I'm about to share with you. So for me, the end goal really, as I said, is over here in this talk is going to be the space of what I would call interactive concept modeling. Now, what is that? Uh, in a sense, it's the fact that you have a creative vision in your head and you would like to turn it into a digital 3D model uh, and more recently, maybe even into a 3D physical model going forward. Uh, but let's, let's, let's at least start with the ability to create a digital 3D model. Now, what's interesting about that is the fact that as an artist, uh, what you're trying to do is communicate. And so what that means is whatever artifact I create, whether it's a drawing uh, or a painting, the idea is that I have some idea in my head and my hope is that people who are going to look at my artifact, whatever that artifact may be, are going to have a very similar idea in their head. There's going to be that, that marriage of being able to transfer through these reverse eyes something to an audience. Uh, now what interactive concept modeling, at least for this talk, is not, is it's not ideation. So this is what I would call sort of an ideation uh, sketch. Well, what is this? So this is a drawing actually that was created by uh, my three-year-old daughter. And when I saw it, I was thinking like Mark said, fish. Uh, and I actually asked her what it was. And at the time, she said, Papa, it's a happy whale. It didn't look particularly happy to me, but whale, OK. And then a few months back, I actually asked her again about it. And uh, she said, what she said was actually quite different. And it gives you a sense of what this whole ideation is all about. She said, Papa, it's John Lennon in the Yellow Submarine. And so there's a process of evolution there. There's sort of a dialogue that is taking place within the individual where you've got uh, a certain amount of externalization of what your mental imagery is. And so you're saying, okay, okay, maybe this is fine for you know, three-year-olds and five-year-olds, but real artists don't do this. This is actually a very famous ideation sketch by a very famous artist that turned into this. Um, this is a drawing by, by Frank Gehry. And uh, again, it's something that, that shows uh, with its dynamism, with its fluidity of strokes, something that is in evolution, something that, that, that the externalization is helping to, uh, to, to concretize. And uh, all of that is very exciting, but that's in some sense, a glimpse of what, what this talk is not about. This talk is about the earlier part, which was what I would call um, sort of conceptual modeling. It comes a little later in the stage when your own ideas have crystallized and you're, you're looking to communicate them with others. So uh, I'm going to take you through a bunch of different projects that, that, that have come out of my, my group over the years. Uh, I sort of call it the evolution of the espresso man uh, out of sort of uh, homage to the Utah teapot, which it's not. And it's something that we've been using in our lab as a benchmark for drawing systems for some time. 
I'll present two systems that are very different from each other. These are, this is early work from around 2008, 2009. I love sketch and analytic drawing. I'll talk about two slightly newer systems called cross-shade and true form. I'll talk about a problem that, that, that is somewhat related, which is how do you take these curves or drawings and actually create surfaces out of them? And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, a newer piece of work uh, called Second Skin. So uh, let's start with I Love Sketch. This is a system that came out back in 2008. Uh, and it, in essence, what we were trying to do was to build a system that was a lot like a drawing system, but require, allowed you to do the kind of things that you typically do in three-dimensional computer software, which is move your view around very frequently and sort of use that multi-view aspect to draw and create things in 3D. So for those of you who are wondering, well, why is this such a complicated problem? Uh, the problem is one of dimensionality. When I create a stroke that is a two-dimensional flat stroke, its depth in the third dimension is completely ambiguous. And, and its perception and other tricks of the trade that we have to sort of rely on to anchor the depth of that stroke. Now, one of the things that happens if you draw from multiple views is you can think of the depth of these strokes from different views kind of going out into space and colliding and forming a curve of intersection, and that is precisely your three-dimensional curve. So you say, well, problem solved. Why, why don't people just do that? And the problem is that it is notoriously difficult to actually imagine and draw from multiple viewpoints uh, the same sort of stroke. So how do we go about this, this, this bit of multi-view sketching? The, the, the trick over here in this system was that we exploit symmetry. So I'm just going to show you a very quick clip of someone drawing with the system. And what you see over here is that the artist is drawing a pair of symmetric curves, and we're using that symmetry from a single view to make it appear as if it was one stroke drawn from multiple viewpoints. That is, a stroke drawn from this view and another one drawn from the camera in the mirror. And then all of a sudden, if you take these two and you know they form a pair, you're able to lift them into three dimensions. So I guess that's playing that again, uh, but that'll be pretty quick. And it's playing it yet again. OK. Uh, so now we're moving. So this was a system that people were able to use. Uh, we actually took it into a high school and got uh, a number of kids to use it and actually create models uh, that we were quite surprised uh, in terms of their quality, in terms of what, what, what people were able to do with such a system. Um, and, and a lot of, a lot of uh, its, its success was, was sort of this, this single view symmetric sketch method where we were actually doing multi-view sketching but from a single viewpoint. Um, so around the time that we were doing this, we said, okay, this is great. But if the idea is that we want people to take something that's in their head and get it out, is that what people are actually doing here when they, when they draw uh, two symmetric curves? And so we wanted to try this out, and we actually asked people to do some tests along these lines. So we gave them a symmetric object with a little missing piece over there, and we said, okay, you know, fill in the missing piece, just draw it. And what we found was that people actually are not that good at it. They, 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 they often make systematic uh, errors. In this case, one of the things that we noticed was people have a tendency to systematically flatten their strokes. So all of a sudden, what that means is that yes, people are drawing symmetric pairs, and yes, they are being able to create some three-dimensional strokes that, that maybe they're satisfied with, but are those the strokes that they actually have in their head? I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're not exactly what they want. But uh, this is something that is an important, uh, important piece of the puzzle that we need to look at going forward so following up on what Mark said, 
humans actually have an audio in and audio out, and yes, we have a video in. We don't have a video out, but there's another problem. Our video in is actually biased, and we need to take that bias into consideration uh, when, we, when we build modeling systems and rendering systems, hopefully uh, going forward. So as an example, I'm not going to, uh, I often do this as a live demonstration, but there are a number of you in the audience that have actually seen this. So I won't do the demonstration here, but typically, uh, which of these looks more like a cube to most of you? How many of you say the one on the left looks more like a cube? How many of you find the one on the right looks more like a cube? Okay. So maybe you guys, some of you uh, don't have the same bias that, uh, that, that, that a lot of us have. Uh, most people would actually find the, oh, sorry, I was mixing up my left and right. No, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> most people actually, most of you that raised your hands uh, actually found the one over there uh, as, as, as more like the cube-like structure, and that one actually is 40% deeper than an actual cube. So there's, there, there's a clear and a consistent bias over here. So what that means is if I'm building a sketching system and a user draws what they think is a cube and I just infer it without, without filtering it, you know, without creating this perceptual gamma filter, what I'm going to get is something that is way elongated. On the other hand, if I'm a designer and I want to communicate with a client something that looks like a perfect cube, and I render it without accounting for that perceptual filter, I'm going to create something that is much flatter than what I would like to con convey. So, so this is an important, important affordance that, that I would say is largely missing in, in systems today and, uh, and, and should be looked at going forward. So uh, while we were doing these tests and while we were doing these studies, um, we had one artist that did all these tests quite perfectly. Uh, so one of the examples that we'd asked people to do was, oh, here's a square. Draw a circle in the middle of the square uh, that's about half the, half the size of the side of the square. Or here's a cylinder. Draw the center line uh, in the middle of the cylinder. We did, I think we had about four or five different tasks like this, drawing tasks. And this guy got, was getting them all spot on. And of course, uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that one thing that seems to have helped him are all these lines over there. You know, it's almost like this gantry that he's built uh, his drawing upon. So we talked to him about it, and he said, yeah, well, you know, you go to design school, and of course, this is what they teach you. Uh, and this is the Bible, and you should go, to, uh, go and get uh, Francis Ching's book and, and read it. So we started to read it, and around the time that we started to read it, uh, one of the guys in my lab said, no, no, you know, forget this. I've been on YouTube. There's a much cooler book, but it does the same thing, and it does it better. It's called How to Draw Cars the Hot Wheels Way. And so it's actually fascinating. You can go out. Uh, there's an artist called Scott Robertson, and he's got tons of videos on there. And, 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 and he builds these scaffolds that are incredibly intricate. And they actually serve two purposes. One is they help a viewer understand the drawing. And second, they help the artist actually create things with a little more precision. And so we drew some inspiration from this. And we said, OK, let's, let's actually build our own analytic drawing system. And here's a simple example of how it might work. And what you'll see is we'll spend some time. We'll define some vanishing points. Uh, in two-point perspective over here, we'll start to draw some guidelines. And we're continuing to draw. And after what seems like an awfully long time and a lot of work, we'll end up with a cube. And you'll say, oh, wow, that's a lot of hard work for something that you could have just you know, pressed a button and created uh, using a primitive uh, like, like Arik showed in his talk uh, or, or a number of other systems. But the thing to keep in mind is that this is a pure drawing interface. The system by itself, a priori, knows nothing about what you're actually drawing, and so it scales. You can go well beyond this. You can take the same ideas, and once you start to create these scaffolds, 
you can create curved shapes, you can create various kinds of uh, shapes that are arbitrarily complex. And so how does this work? The way it works is that the scaffold that we create, think of it in some sense as an adaptive three-dimensional grid that you're creating. What it does is it provides you constraints on the position of points, on the direction in which points should be imagined and viewed on the lengths of, uh, of lines, of lengths of curves. And if you combine that with a few geometric priors, things like straight lines, circular arcs, certain, certain kind of curved shapes that are desirable, all of a sudden you get a model that actually works really well. It's, it's, it's sort of a probabilistic model. You see how many constraints are satisfied, and in that redundancy, you can resolve the ambiguity. So, so as an example over here, you see that green stroke. Now, it could have many different uh, interpretations. It could pass through the back of the cube and then come along the side of the diagonal, or it could be the curve that you, the line that, that is what is interpreted, which is the one that passes along the front of, of kind of the cube kind of sur uh, surface being built. Okay, so these, these are two interesting systems, very different in nature. One is very much a multi-view sketching system. You're frequently moving around, changing your viewpoint, and exploiting that multi-view capability. The second is a very pure drawing interface. It's, it's, it's as if you're working on paper. You're staying in a single view, largely, and trying to use the scaffold to help solve the problem. I'm gonna talk about two other systems. Um, the first one uh, is actually what started it, and it started it from a very different uh, motivation, actually, from three-dimensional three modeling. What we saw was that a number of artists, designers, draw persistently, consistently, and they're drawing these concept sketches all the time. They, they explore, they form. The key, as Spike mentioned, was they're fast to draw. A few strokes is incredibly efficient. And then after they were done with that, well, they'd have to present it to the, their design chief or they'd have to present it to their client. And what that meant was they'd have to take those drawings on, that you see on the right and, uh, and shade them up so they looked all nice and beautiful in three dimensions that you see on the left. And then, of course, they'd go to the client and, you know, after all these hours of work, and the client would say, yeah, well, okay, that's fabulous. Can, can I see it in red with the light, you know, coming from above? And they'd have to go back and spend many hours essentially reshading it. And so, so, so this is an aspect that we thought, well, you know, maybe we, ha we may have a shot at trying to automate it because when people look at this, they, they, they have a strong understanding of the form. There is something there that our perceptual system is tuning into and, and exploiting. And so the goal over here was to basically take a drawing like that and with a push of a button, get something that looks like this. It's not a 3D model, but it has the appearance of one. So to try and understand that, what we did was we, we spent a lot of time going through a bunch of design books where people were talking about um, talking about this, this process, this style of design drawing, and sometimes the problem is that artists and scientists don't always speak the same language, uh, but there were interesting, you know, anecdotal references that we were able to pull out, cross-sections explain or emphasize curvature, they bend or transform the object surface, um, various things like that. In particular, what was interesting was these curves that we're calling cross-sections when they come together and they intersect, those are interesting places, and we call them kind of crosshairs. And the first thing that we wanted to try and understand was how well do people understand crosshairs? And we did a little study. We had people, a bunch of people, go and try and draw little arrows to describe the way they thought the surface was oriented at a crosshair. And we found that, yes, by and large, people are pretty persistent, they're consistent, they're <coughs> accurate in figuring out what the surface looks like at these crosshairs. And what this helped us to do was come up with a number of what are actually fairly simple properties, things that if you think of these cross-section curves as planar curves, they cross at right angles. Not only do they cross at right angles, the curves themselves 
uh, our local curvature lines uh, where they where they where they meet, they happen to be locally geodesic. Uh, not always, but often they're locally geodesic. What that essentially means is that one cross section is a plane of symmetry for the other one. Uh, and then generally people don't draw things overly foreshortened. There's some tricks in terms of orientation. But in essence, we had these nice five properties, and that really was uh, all we needed to come up with something that would go from a drawing like this to something that was beautifully shaded. And the way it worked was we'd come up with the planes, we'd compute the planes. This was essentially an optimization problem where you try to satisfy those five properties that we talked about. Once you have that, once you have these planes, essentially their cross product gives you this normal vector at a crosshair. Uh, you propagate that normal uh, along the cross section curves. One thing that we tried to do was minimize twist to keep the surface is nice and smooth. And then we took the normals on the curves and we kind of propagated them into the interior using a form of structured interpolation. And then what we had was this very nice three-dimensional normal field. And that's it. And you shade it and you get some nice looking results. So what you're seeing over here essentially was the drawn curves on, on your right and a little bit of information in terms of color and where you want your light, and then with a push of button, you can explore various kinds of shading and so on. And this was great. We were very excited and we said, okay, this is fabulous. Now what we can do is make actual 3D models out of it. And so this was presented uh, one year and we said, okay, next year we're gonna do 3D modeling. In fact, the next year we failed because it turns out, and we learned the hard way, that 3D rendering, the requirements and assumptions of 3D rendering are actually fundamentally different from 3D modeling. And what does that mean? What it means is, uh, let's say you take the 2D sketches that you see over here, uh, one of this sort of vacuum cleaner-like object and this one of uh, sort of a freeform surface. Firstly, in cross-shade, what we would get out of that was uh, only a partial subset because we had to have all these planar curves. So anything that was not planar, we couldn't deal with. And then uh, the problem was what we would try and do is we would try and minimize for all those constraints at the same time. The problem is very often there's noise in a sketch. There's inaccuracies in how we draw and that would get absorbed into the minimization and you'd get this very smooth field which our eyes are able to ignore when we render the drawing. But all you had to do was, if you use that normal field to actually create a three-dimensional object, the moment you turn things a little bit, everything looks wrong. Things are not exactly parallel. Things that you expect to be perpendicular are not perpendicular. And so that's the key problem. The problem is that if you want to do 3D modeling, you have to realize that the drawing is not sacred and you need to be able to vary the drawing as needed to be able to establish some constraints, not all the constraints. And the problem is figuring out which constraints to satisfy. So, so that led us then, you know, that insight was one year of failed research and then the, we, we sort of came back and said, okay, great. So let's figure out what these, what these properties are and firstly, we had to say, okay, the sketch sort of reflects the three-dimensional geometry. And so, but if you go way, just based on this notion of fidelity, well, a flat representation, just the sketch that you turn around is, is, is a perfect representation in three dimensions. So that's by itself, it's not very useful. Uh, but then there's this thing called regularity, which is oftentimes 3D curves or curves, they capture three-dimensional constraints. They trigger things in our brains that make us lift these curves off the page into three dimensions. And the trick is that it's based on context. Those two curves we think of as being parallel. Those two are not. How do you decide? And firstly, is this true that humans actually perceive these regularity properties consistently? And so we did perform a study based on that. We sh showed uh, a bunch of sketches to users, asked them whether they thought certain uh, 
properties existed or didn't exist. And we found that, yeah, humans are actually very consistent. Sometimes they're not. And actually, the times that they were not was well correlated with the fact when our algorithm actually failed and didn't do all that well. So, so that was a good sign. Uh, and so I'll just show a short, uh, a short video that will show some of the results of this system. True to Form is a conceptual modeling tool that applies design and perception principles to lift 2D sketches off the page into user-intended 3D shapes. We exploit descriptive curves that designers strategically sketch to convey 3D information, selectively detecting the right set of sketch properties to enforce is what makes our approach click. Okay, so what we've looked at so far is a number of systems that help us draw things more or less in a void. We sort of have an idea in our head, and we're working with this blank canvas. We, we, we've looked at a multi-view sketching system. We've looked at a pure drawing system. We've looked at drawings that are much more uh, in tune with the way designers draw. And we've tried to loosen all these kinds of curve constraints uh, and, and, and try to uh, make it so that people are just able to work unencumbered and come up with these, these nice three-dimensional uh, networks of essentially what are curves. Well, everything in the end, if you want to 3D print something or you want to create an actual model that you animate afterwards, the curves aren't enough. You need to go beyond that. And so there's a whole different, interesting, unsolved at the moment, ongoing research area of what would be surfacing an arbitrary 3D curve network, or not maybe an arbitrary, a designer curve 3D network. And so what that means is, look at this as some kind of a scaffold or a wire, three-dimensional wire sculpture. And now imagine how you might be able to figure out where the surfaces are and perhaps automatically or with as little user interaction as possible, create nice looking surfaces that you can then use for animation, use for downstream applications and so on. Uh, so we've done some work here. Other people have done uh, some nice follow up work. Um, I won't go into the details of that work, but just to so, so you can appreciate what the problems here are. What are the problems? The problem is, firstly, if you think of the curve network as just a graph in, in three, three space, the first thing you need to figure out if you want to patch something is where are the cycles? Which, which loops of curves are going to define your patches? So for example, that's a pretty good uh, cycle of curves to patch. That one is not. In general, if you think of this as a graph, uh, you will realize very quickly that, that it has an exponential number of cycles. So exhaustively going through the cycles uh, and then you know, trying to come up with this, what is typically a very small subset that you are going to surface is, is not the best way. There, 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 there are a number of techniques uh, uh, to, to try and help prune that, that, that exponential space. Once you have a cycle, Patching that cycle is also a non-trivial task. If you look at some of these patches over here, they are highly concave, they are highly, they, they have very, very, uh, what I would call somewhat strange looking shapes, but they, they are still patchable and, and most people actually have a clear expectation of, of what it would look like. So to give you an idea of how, you know, how complex some of these, these surfacing problems can be, here's the result of one of our pieces of work on, on this kind of boat model. And the challenges here are finding the surfaces, uh, being able to surface them in a nice way, uh, as well as being able to control things like the genus of the object, trying to figure out where the surface is closed, where it's open. Uh, these, these are complex problems. Okay, so on to the last bit that I wanted to uh, briefly touch upon, it's a system called Second Skin. And the reason why I talk about it right at the very end is it's, well, firstly, it's recent, but, but other than that, uh, it actually brings things round circle nicely. So far, you saw a bunch of systems 
that are designed to work with three-dimensional curves and then look at ways of building surfaces and volumes as a different process, a different uh, way of working. And out here, what we were trying to do was essentially looking at people that draw uh, things in a layered fashion. A lot of people that work in layered systems, they, they start out with some kind of a template uh, object or whatever. Many times they'll bring it into Photoshop in a particular view, and then they'll start drawing over it. So they're drawing on it, they're drawing around it, they're drawing, essentially they're drawing as if they're drawing in freely, but in fact, there are strong perceptual cues that the underlying template or the underlying piece of geometry is giving us in terms of how we can make sense out of these strokes. And so there is a set of about four different kinds of strokes that we looked at, but in essence, by merging uh, these ideas with the fact that because these are on top of certain, an existing piece of geometry, we're also able to surface them uh, automatically. We're able to get something that's on the left very quickly. I'll show a sh short video of this system in action. Users of Second Skin simply draw as if on paper using typical digital sketching and editing functionality. The 2D strokes are inferred in 3D relative to the geometry of the active base layer. We present a set of 3D curve types commonly drawn when depicting layered structures. Salient features and including contours of underlying geometry can impact a viewer's perception of a drawn stroke. To improve classification, we perform a 2D shape matching step between drawn strokes and prescribed feature curves. Curves which fall outside of our classification can be created from context by anchoring strokes to known 3D positions and classified curves. So as a result of, uh, of a system like this, basically for these sort of problems, uh, that, that design was modeled in about 30, about 15 minutes or so. Similar models of similar complexity often take artists you know, well into many hours uh, to, to create. Um, but that's a good example of where you can anchor some domain knowledge. All the systems prior to this that I mentioned they, they, they sort of work in the void. And here you're actually harnessing um, some, some, some prior uh, knowledge of shape to help you with the inference process. So I'd like to just quickly bring all of this together. Um, we talked about a few different things that ingredients that go into building a good interactive sketch-based modeling system. The one that's probably the most interesting is, is this one over here, perceived regularity. That's, that's, that's the property that really helps you take something that is a flat depiction on a piece of paper and lift it up, bring it into three dimensions. And the four systems that I presented all use completely different techniques in doing so. The first one, I Love Sketch, uses the property of symmetry. Uh, analytic three uh, 3D used this idea of a gantry or a scaffold. Uh, to create these regularity cues. Uh, true to form used things like orthogonal crosshairs, tangents, uh, actually a mixed bag of such cues. And then finally, second skin actually used the underlying geometry and its salient curves as a way of, of, of kind of taking you into the third dimension. And as a result of that, that also defines what your system is uh, all about, whether it's likely to be what you would call a multi-view system or a single-view system. Multi-view systems are ones where you're constantly changing your viewpoint. You're drawing, you're, you're spending as much time in frequent view changes as you're spending drawing. And those systems are successful if you can, if you can lift, your, lift your sketches, your, your strokes off the page with very little context. So in the example of I Love Sketch, all you needed was a pair of symmetric curves. In the case of Second Skin, which is another sort of more like a multi-view style, uh, again, each stroke was, uh, was almost instantly classify, classifiable based on the underlying geometry. On the other hand, systems like analytic 3D drawing and true to form, they require more context. You have to have a bunch of these curves starting to interplay and talk to each other and work with each other. 
And so those are more like single view drawing systems. You stay in a view, you draw for a while, and then when you actually have some critical mass to come up with a three-dimensional representation, then you can start to move around. So uh, just a few key messages, I guess, that you can take from this talk is uh, there is centuries of visual experience captured in artistic practice. Uh, uh, it's something that I'd like to do, uh, and uh, I, I, I hope you know many of you that have an interest in this area will do. There, 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 there are tons of you know interesting design books where people describe things, often not in a very scientific, certainly not in a very mathematical way, but there's a lot of rich content there that can be exploited. Uh, yes, we have no video out, and our video in is biased, so that's something we should be aware of when building future systems. Uh, for 3D sketch modeling, um, perceived regularity is really the secret sauce. That's, that's the thing that you need to figure out. How are you going to create that perception that will help people pull things out into three dimensions? Uh, and then the key is fine. Even though you have your techniques based on artistic and perceptual insights, uh, make sure you leave ultimate control, creative control, in the hands of the users. Uh, artists often are control freaks. They have a, an end goal in mind, and, and the tool should not get in the way of that. And as a result, yes, we built a lot of tools. Better tools gives you a better video out. Better tools does not give you better content. If the creative vision that you have in your head is not particularly interesting, no matter how good the tool is, it's not going to fix it. And I think that's a very important and a humbling message uh, for, for scientists when they build tools that, that, that sort of support the artistic practice. And the last thing, actually, I, uh, is just something I added because I, I, it was something that, that kind of got me thinking uh, watching Spike's talk. Where, where he had this comment from Dave Byrne about, you know, a perfect line is not a crooked line, and maybe, you know, that may be part of, part of why digital practice kind of gets in the way and, 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 and is not, at some point, is not as appealing as, uh, as maybe traditional uh, art and traditional artwork. I said, so, well, okay, but what if you use digital tools to get a perfectly crooked line. So you kind of combine the two. Would that still, you know, would that solve everything? Yes, it would allow you to maybe get things that were messy or appeared more human, but what they would still miss in of themselves is a human touch. I, I mean, I still like to draw myself, and, and I do like to use charcoal, not only because it's there, uh, but because I like to get my hands dirty. And that's not something that I can do with any of the digital tools that, that I've created. Um, and, and, and so there's that, there's that visceral physicality of, of some, of these, um, some of these traditional media that I think there, 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 there is some satisfaction that we get from that. And while the digital tools I've built uh, will not solve that, will, they, they, they do not address that. I'm hoping, and some of the other talks might start to think about this, is the promise of three-dimensional printing and physical fabrication will have the ability to allow you to actually get closer to that, that physical connection that, that, that we miss a little bit in the digital world. I'll stop there with uh, some acknowledgments uh, to uh, my co-authors. Um, these are mostly the papers that I kind of touched on in, in the talk, and you can find um, out about them and other papers uh, at, at, at that site. Thanks.